in the mood, uh, getting everybody connected and sort of getting the ideas out. And what you'll find is that we'll keep revisiting certain ideas, but we'll build on top of them and it'll, it'll get more sort of complex as we, as we go forward. I'm noticing a couple of people aren't there, but we'll, <clears throat> we'll carry on. So if you can see my screen, I did put up display a picture of the stromatolites from Cardiff Museum, 3.57 billion years old. So that's one of the oldest organic rocks that we have. And, um, <clears throat> but also as it, once the plate tectonics started moving around and the, the mantle of the earth started moving is some of the rocks then were subducted back into the mantle and melted down again. So a lot of the really, really, really old rocks are very hard to find because they've been recycled. Um, but once they figured out what they were looking for, they then found evidence of these stromatolites everywhere. There would have been shallow, warm seas all around the, the planet at that time with these strange organisms growing that slowly created the atmosphere of the planet. So there we go. So we're going to go into, I'm going to go through this slideshow and then we're going to do a, a little activity on, on life's journey, which we call the river of life, which is kind of a, a chance for you to reflect on the journey that you've been on and what you still hope to achieve. Uh, but I'm just going to do a sort of general permaculture chat, really. So, um, ah, look, Elandra, you've got your own window now. Look at that. <laughs> All right, she's coming. Hiya. Okay, so I, I subtitle is Permaculture, Can We Survive Climate Chaos? And obviously the answer is, I have no idea. But what I know is that we won't survive it unless we make significant changes. Those changes need to be informed by reality, by a kind of the biology and chemistry of our planet, if you like. In fact, I used to work in a, a place called Kumhari, an organization called Kumhari in Newtown, and they made um, compost from food waste. And, and I got involved in processing the compost and using it to start gardens. And there's a guy there called Richard Northridge, who was the, uh, the, the, the source, of the originator of the Kumhari project. And he said, Permaculture is the transition from physics to biology. I thought that was kind of interesting. I think in the, back in the 40s and 50s, we thought we were going to save all of our problems with technology. We were going to have nuclear reactors and high technology things. We kind of dreamt that was going to solve all of our problems. But actually, that took us away from understanding the biology of the planet. And that's what we need to reconcile. We need to really get back on board is everything's a subset of this biological system, you know, us included. And we have to, for us to be able to survive and to proliferate and, and that we need to reconcile that relationship with the living planet. Uh, okay. Um, I'll do that. Ah, yeah, okay, so that slide, that is Mabira Forest. That's in Uganda. Um, somewhere between Kampala and Jinja. Now my friend, uh, Prabhaka Sharma, who grew up in, in Uganda, he lives in, uh, in, in UK now, he remembers driving from Kampala to Jinja uh, in the 70s and it being kind of scary because you're just going through this dark tunnel of, of, uh, of um, equatorial rainforest. And now it's just shrunk. There's hardly anything there. Uh, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Anyway, when we, you go to Mabira Forest, there is part of it as a reserve. And this, uh, this is what nature does all by itself. So we all talk about gardening and farming and stuff, but this is what nature does by itself. It creates an ecosystem, enormous diversity and complexity. It takes time, but it gets there eventually. And in Mabira Forest, there were 200 species of birds unique to that place. 100 species of butterfly. The butterflies have wings bigger than your hands. I mean, it's just, awesome and the, the, the monkeys and birds and just just every bit of it is alive you have to be really careful when you're standing on the ground there's ants and termites and all that sort of stuff um this is what nature does by itself so there's the first really important idea in, in permaculture is nature is there as our teacher it's there to teach us and we can learn through observing and interacting with nature we the more, more we're conscious of this relationship that we have, the more we accept the information, and you know, really by seeing what's there, um, then 
the, the deeper our understanding is. So first is the study of nature is our teacher and, and everything we need to know is there in the forest. Um, Bill Mollison said, if we lost all the universities in the world, we'd have lost nothing. If we lose the forest, we've lost everything. Bill liked to say controversial statements. He got a, got a mileage out of that, but he, he's trying to really challenge you to get out, really understand the natural world is there to teach us and as an amazing resource. And if we're going to survive the changes and the challenges we've made on the planet, that's how we're going to do it. Nature has these hardwired into it. It has these patterns. And in, in permaculture, we're fascinated by the pattern language of nature. So we're seeing there as a cactus. Um, and you, I think you all must be probably aware of the Fibonacci series. That it's a mathematical um, concept, which is if you just take left number one and you add one and one together, you get two. If you add two and one together, you get three. If you add, add um, and, and, and so the sequence goes. Again, we'll enlarge on it. But it creates a spiral pattern. So there's something hardwired into nature. We see that pattern everywhere. So there's something interesting about nature. It has this dynamism. It can, it can do this thing called succession. It can build complexity. And the complexity that it builds seems to conform to all sorts of different patterns. So we could say permaculture is a pattern language in some ways. Elandra, you have a question. Steve, I did, I did um, a little activity about the same thing that you're talking about, like the patterns on like pineapples as well. That's exactly right. You see it on pineapples, you do. That's wonderful. That's great. So that's you beginning to observe nature. Nature observes and cor corresponds to patterns. Those patterns repeat. And sometimes you get lots and lots of the same repeating pattern and creates enormous complexity, but it's created out of quite simple things. It's a very simple mathematical formula. But the other thing you'll notice that when you look at that repeating pattern on, on the cactus there is they're not exactly the same. And that's because everything as, it, as it's growing, as it's developing, it's interacting with the environment, with the living world. So the wind's blowing, it's raining, some of it's a bit shadowed, a bit shaded, and some of it isn't. Um, in some places, you know, it might get eaten a bit by a bird or something like that. So as anything is, is growing and expressing itself, it's also interacting with the environment. And that means that everything, although it's created from the same formula, everything is different. So again, is nature has hardwired into it, very simple pattern language, but it gives us diversity. And that's why everybody's fingerprints are different and all of the, you know, no leaf is exactly the same as another one, or no snowflake. It's everything is interacting with this natural changing world. The wind's blowing, the sun's shining, or it's cold, it's hot, it's um, the conditions are never exactly the same, so we get different things. Um, the next thing actually, when we look into nature is it's all about relationships. And it's, it's very interesting dynamic relationships. And I've already brought the idea that we maybe many species are composites. They're not actually a single species. They are several different species acting together. So we bring ideas of symbiosis, synergy, um, and, and these, how interactions are hardwired into everything in the natural world. So we're looking at a picture of a thorn tree. It's an acacia, it's a kind of acacia, and it grows, that's in um, Murchison Falls National Park in, in Uganda. And if you look at it carefully though, you'll notice that it's got these little, they're galls, they're little um, spheres. You can see them sticking out around the edge of the, around the, edge of the tree. <clears throat> um, and that is the product. We all know what an oak gall is. You must have seen one. You look on an oak tree and sometimes have these little spherical wooden structures on them. And you ask yourself, well, what's that? It's not an acorn, it's not a bud, it's not a twig. What is it? And it's, it's the result of a wasp laying its egg in the bud of the, um, of the oak tree. And as that bud develops, instead of growing into a bit of tree, it grows into this gall, this sphere, and inside is a little grub that will eat all the uh, stuff inside, the sugars and things inside, and come out to be a new wasp. So that's a kind of interesting thing, that the insects can interact with plants and then change how that plant develops. 
Um, so what you're seeing here is a, it's a termite that's laid its egg in the tree, and the termite is, um, the termite considers the tree as its home, and <clears throat> it's laying its eggs there. And you might think, why? So the, the tree is growing away, photosynthesizing, it's producing sugar, the energy that it needs. And one thing the tree is doing is it's pumping that sugar down into its roots and it's feeding the soil bacteria that are again bringing nutrients to the tree. So there's a trade off there. So why would the tree be so happy to give up sugars to the termite? One may ask, as we start to think about this, nature's our teacher. We're looking at this, this kind of a, 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 a paradox or whatever. Why is that happening? And the answer is quite simple. It's interesting is this tree is the favorite food of the giraffe. And interestingly, what happens is the giraffe comes along and thinks, yeah, I want to access some of that sugar from that tree. And again, the acacia is quite happy to give up some of its energy to the giraffe because the giraffe is going to help distribute its seeds and, and, and you know, help propagate the plant. But if it eats the whole thing, the plant's going to die. So what happens is the giraffe comes along and starts nibbling at the bush, and that annoys the termites. And they all rush out and they start squirting formic acid at it, sort of stinging the mouth of the, um, of the giraffe. So it then moves on. So this is another example of nature self-regulating. The tree can actually regulate how much it's prepared to give up to the giraffe by um, actioning the, 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 the the termites. So you've got a very interesting relationship between different species that shows how that thing actually regulates. And that's one of the ideas that becomes very central in permaculture is we, we, we're trying to all time, time understand that nature runs on mutually beneficial relationships. And therefore in our own design and things that we're doing deliberately and consciously, we want to, be able to do it in a way in which it, it creates and fosters and enhances mutually beneficial relationships um, in a sort of dynamic way. So that, I, I really like that example. Um, there's another simple idea in poem culture is that of succession. And that nature abhors a vacuum. And wherever the conditions are right, so this is what we're looking at here is a tiny rock pool on top of a huge bare bit of rock and climb all the way up it and just bare rock and get to the top and there's a little indent where there's some water trapped and that's enough water there to germinate some seeds that are blown in maybe a bird dropped them and some droppings or something like that and they've germinated and what's going to happen is those plants are going to live and die and photosynthesize trap some energy and then as they die release that carbon which will decompose into compost which creates a bit of soil which then allows something else to move in so that we're also very interested in these, like, these ongoing processes that nature's always moving into new areas and exploring the potential of it. And, and again, this is something we can work with. Nature just wants to grow, it wants to thrive. So really in permaculture, our challenge is to, how can we accelerate that process? How can we support it and help it to happen uh, rather than feeling that we have to do all the work because nature wants to do it anyway. Um, so we can look at succession in different uh, realms and different examples and the slide here is of the really wonderful garden at it's called the Garth Garden and it's just above Glyn Kerriog in the Kerriog Valley so it's just near to uh, Llangollen and it's a thousand feet up in the Welsh mountains it's very steep land and um, it was covered in gorse and gorse is a plant um, that we know here in the UK very well. It's very spiky and spiny, and, um, and it's kind of a low shrubby bush. If you look at gorse very closely though, you recognize the flower shape. And the flower shape looks very much like the flowers you get on your peas and beans. But that tells us something else. That tells us that that gorse is a legume, a leguminous plant. And leguminous plants have this amazing ability to trap nitrogen and build soil. So gorse is a soil building plant. Question. Is that a question? No. Uh, no, okay. Um, 
Now here we see we don't like gorse because it's scratchy and not very nice. And so we kind of try to farmers try and get rid of it. But actually they're failing to realize it's a, it's a very important plant for soil building. And then ultimately it creates a seed bed for other plants to grow inside. So birds will come in and nest and, and, and perch inside the gorse. And they'll drop their droppings will be filled with the seeds and things that they're eating and tree seeds and what have you. And, um, and as the plant grows up, it gets really leggy and starts to fall over. And then there's next level of plants, next generation of plants can grow out through it. So they looked at this process very carefully, um, the, the, the people behind this garden, and they realized that it's it very steep land and it, no one else saw value in it. And they went to the owners of the land and said, we'd like to put a garden there. And they said, oh, good luck. It's really steep and there's no, there's no fertility. Well, they've managed to do it literally by following the successional process. And again, I'll enlarge on, the, on these ideas as we go, go forward. I just wanted to introduce some of these concepts. Okay, so um, this, is a, this is a picture in the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And what we're seeing here is People growing on very, very steep ground, again, it's very low in fertility, and a place where they'll have enormously high rainfall at some time of the year, and then none for months and months on end. And they grow enormous amounts of fruit up there. Some of the best farming systems that I've ever seen are up in the, in the High Atlas Mountains. And you can see the settlement is above where the fields are. And everything about what you're looking at in that landscape, everything is just made from the materials that are there already. And, and, and the foreground is a big river, and that river, obviously when it, the, uh, the snows melt and things like that, which is really in spades, it brings down tons of material, gravels and rocks and boulders. And actually the people, the Moroccans have learned how to, they make little dams and traps in the, in the riverbed so that they get a pile of silt in one place, or a pile of sand, or a pile of rocks. And that's what they've then used to build their terraces and gardens out of. So this is another idea in permaculture is we use local and natural resources. The thing you're going to use to build your system, whatever system it is, is what's lying around. So again, we need to be good at observation to, to, to see the value in the stuff that's around us. And typically, we don't value what we have plenty of, and we just crave the things we don't have. So again, when we turned up in the refugee settlements, in 2018, they thought they expected us to come with loads of stuff from the outside to rescue them or something. I don't know. And right, we said, no, 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 we're going to, everything we're going to do, we're going to build out of what's here, which was mud and sticks and straw and grasses and things like that. And it's amazing what you can do with those simple materials. So I'll be taking you on a proper tour of the mountains at High Atlas in Morocco and talking about their farming systems uh, later on. I just wanted to introduce that to you. Um, yeah, their attention to detail, to trapping water. You see, you, around the base of every tree, there's an indentation. So the rainwater sits in this trap there. And then also they put some mulch, they put some dead organic matter. So that dead organic matter is like a sponge, hold that water and allow it to slowly infiltrate, trickle into the ground to feed the trees long term, to nourish them long term. Uh, the attention to detail in their farming system was really staggering. And it, it made me realize that they might not know about permaculture, they might not have a language for it exactly, but they're all operating off the same rule book. So there's a, a cultural knowledge embedded in that community about how to manage the landscape in a, in a sort of sensitive, organic, and we would say permaculture way. So it's really fascinating. And it made me think about how deficient our culture is, that we don't have that ability. Um, you saw those pictures of everyone being to the seaside in Dorset the other day and left literally tons and tons of garbage and just trash on the beach. It's, that's a deficiency of our kind of collective education or something to think that that's okay. I mean, it's, I don't know. Anyway, yep. Yeah, so a bit more of that. Oh, we'll, um, so again, thinking about patterns and patterning, this was a, just a garden design that we came up. Okay, this was a, what I'm just displaying now is a drawing that a, a student created on a permaculture course in 2010. We went and looked at a bit of land behind a compost factory in Newtown, and we came up with an idea of turning it into a community garden. 
So I, I presented these ideas to Come Harry, and they liked them so much, they gave me a job, which kept me busy for the next five years. So I expect some good design work from you guys. You know, I'm reliable. <coughs> but um, so the outputs of this thinking, is, especially is you need to be able to visualize what your end goal is as well. We're thinking about the individual components that we've assembled together, but also trying to create a vision of where we want to get to and, and think about the multiple functions that there might be within that space. And again, we'll, I'll, I'll enlarge on that as we go further along. Um, so that was, our, that was our sort of concept dream drawing of the garden. And then as we actually constructed it, then that became the detailed map. So again, in permaculture, we'll so we moved from patterns, from kind of visualizations and big picture thinking to actual detail. And you, as we get drilled down through the layers, we get more and more detail into, into, into our designs. Um, so this is our community garden in Newtown. Uh, this is someone else's community garden, oh, this is someone else's garden. But just, I just thought about spacing, I love the spacing in this, and obviously I love the uh, espalier trees, and thinking about three-dimensional gardening. We try to think about things, like in the, this previous picture, it's a bit 2D, whereas actually nature's three-dimensional, we can go up in all sorts of different directions. And by careful strategic placement of elements, we can create systems that become much, much stronger as a whole. So, for example, that, that, that those trees might function as a windbreak or add a bit of extra shade or um, they'll be contributing more soil carbon, which will help build the fertility of the garden. So we're trying to think about how these different components work together and how they contribute to the overall system. <sighs> That's Anglesey, North Wales. What's wrong with that? When I look at that landscape, this is what we, I would call a sheep desert. This is, ah, go on, you have a, what were you going to tell us? Um, I wanted to say that I've been to Ankle Sea with oh, right. my granddad Dave. Cool, I've been to Ankle Sea too and it's really nice. But I'm now just being really rude about it and saying it's a sheep desert. And the thing about sheep is everybody thinks sheep eat grass. And the truth is they eat everything else first. And then they, when there's only grass left, they eat that. So what they do is that they remove all the diversity from the landscape. They eat all the herbs first, the nice flowers and interesting things. And one of the reasons that that happens and that sheep have such a impact on our landscape in Wales is they're not from Wales. Sheep come from the Middle East, they come from Iran, Iraq sort of thing, and they're, they're also mountain creatures. And in the natural world, sheep would be fearful of wolves and predators and things like that. And so they wouldn't just be all over the landscape, they'd be up in the tops of the mountains, they're very good at climbing. That's their defense mechanism, is going up into steep slopes, where they'd actually eat quite coarse, rough, things and um, they wouldn't have this impact on the landscape. And unfortunately what farming has done over many successive generations is we simplified the landscape horrendously. We've literally farmed, moved out all the trees. Um, even there aren't really hedges here, they're just stone walls. So you just think, where are the birds supposed to go? Where, where's, 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 the, where's the refuge for the diversity in that system? And again, it's part of our journey in permaculture is to understand when we look at that, a lot of people come to Wales on holiday and they look at that landscape and they go, ah, oh, it's beautiful, it's nature, it's lovely. And I don't really see it like that, that way. I see it as a burnt out hollow shell of what used to be nature, which all that nature has been removed. It would have been a forest. It would have been a forest with clearings and, 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 and complex diversity in it. And, and, and we've lost all of that to this idea of monoculture of producing Sheep, 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 and then more sheep, and then even more sheep, and then subsidizing that and, and influencing behaviors. Yeah, Duncan. Um, one fact ish um, isn't it that 90% of the land of Wales uh, is given over to sheep and maybe cattle farming, but produces about 1% of the GDP? Yeah. So it's uh, an extremely inefficient use 
of the land for, from any point of view. Yeah, St staggeringly so. Thanks for that 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 uh, statistic. It is. This is part of this huge journey that we've got to go on. Is to think about how to reintroduce complexity back into these landscapes. So um, this next slide is. This is from East Timor, which is an island between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, and there is a fantastic permaculture community in the Timor Leste, they call it, and they have created the Tropical Permaculture Guidebook, which um, I strongly recommend. You can download it for free. Definitely, Faya, you need to look at that, um, and we'll put a link up for it. Um, and this is some of the illustrations that they commissioned from local artists in Papua New Guinea. Uh, sorry, in um, uh, Timor Leste, to start to visualize what a more complex permaculture integrated landscape might look like. And the features that we're seeing there is diversity, diversity, diversity. Everything that they're doing there is slightly different approaches to different things. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on with water. I can see a series of ponds that overflow into each other. Some have got ducks in them, some have got fish in them. Some of them are doing different perhaps functions as well as maybe holding water for watering gardens. We've got uh, sort of forested areas. We've got nice little compounds with uh, those pigs or something in it. And there's another one with chickens. Each one of those creating a different kind of environment and utilizing the resources around it in a slightly different way. So you've got the opposite of a situation where you've just got sheep over 90% of the landscape all doing the same thing. Here we've got really many different kinds of things, all interacting in different ways, and both giving and taking in, in different ways. We still have got lovely raised beds and complex gardens down the bottom. If you think about the lower slopes of the hill, that's where the water will arrive, arrive last, and that will be the most hydrated part of the landscape. So that's a great place within your, your cultivation, intensive of cultivation. And the more you look into the picture, you can, the more you can see this, just lovely ideas of diversity and exploring different niches, if you like, within, within, within the, the space. And that's the kind of thing that we're really interested in, is thinking about the stepping stones that move us towards creating complex, diverse systems. Now, quite a few permaculture designers would say you really need to have as much water in your landscape as you can. So trapping water in ponds. Now, maybe if you can get 10 or 15% of the landscape to be water, um, it, it enormously boosts its, its potential for productivity. Um, so this is um, a little bit hard to see. Is um, that is Shanvathlin? You're seeing there some the, the town and the new spa site and the car park you can see down the bottom. And between the Shanvathlin sort of town and the river, the Kine is a meadow, it's about seven acres, I think. And in 2014, a uh, local landowner released that land to make it available to the community. And a lot of people, we all kind of went and looked at it and thought about what we could do. And all the time I had in mind about creating complexity and diversity within, again, it was just another sheep pasture, another sheep desert. And we did some very simple things to, to create that diversity in it. Um, we, I, I planted 80 meters of willow coppice. Um, willow is one of the fastest growing trees in a temperate climate. And if you cut it off at the ground, you get a multi-stemmed um, sort of shrub really growing. And willow is a fantastic material for building things out of, um, for e energy, uh, animals like to graze it. So it's something which you, you really can't have too much of. And it also functions as a windbreak and as a wildlife corridor linking the river um, back in, in, in more into, into the rest of the field. So that was one of the things we did. And the, the other element that we did, thinking about diversity again, was we created a, a food forest, an orchard, but it's a heritage orchard. We put in it every single, there's about a hundred fruit trees in it and every one is a different variety. Um, so that we've not just got one kind of tree, we've got as many different kinds as we can, and then we've underplanted them with herbs and, uh, and uh, fruit bushes and things like that. So we thought about how our landscape might serve to create biological diversity, also diversity of habitats, 
and also diversity of functions for the community because we can interact with it and pick the berries and the herbs and, and the fruits and, and what have you. So just trying to sort of really show from, from examples from around the world when we're using the same approaches, but what you generate always looks unique. Back to the idea about the simple pattern language. Um, we actually, there's a map of the region of the, of the first plants and trees. Now I'm going to invite you on the weekend when you come, you get a chance to come and see this orchard. We're really proud of it and it's really beautiful. So that, that'd be something we can do. Um, one of the ways that we broke into, because the problem is it's very hard to break out of pasture. When you had this uh, monoculture, uh, sheep desert, continuous grazing going on, it's then very hard for other plants to get established in that grass. And they it get also farmers reseed their pasture with rye grasses and things that are quite aggressive, strong, fast growing plants. So very hard to um, very hard to, to break through that and to create a, a start the succession so we can regenerate to a more complex land, uh, landscape. One of the main tools that we use for that, again, is another plant and it's called yellow rattle. And yellow rattle is a parasitic plant. Rather than its roots grow into the ground, they grow into the roots of the grasses and it steals the energy from the grass and weakens it. And that's another way in which then by Weakening the grass, you create possibilities then for other species to move in and for it to just naturally become diverse without having to add, constantly be planting things. It happens by itself. So again, it's, it's back to the idea of how, as permaculture designers, how do we accelerate this natural succession that nature just wants to do. Nature wants to be diverse. And we're here to help that happen and to accelerate that process. Um, establishing our trees in Kaibodvak. Um, yeah, coppicing. Again, I'm going to enlarge on this later on. It's a very, very important and sustainable way of producing natural materials that we can work with. And also through coppicing, you can actually choose the shape and the size and the diameter of the wood that you're creating. So you could coppice trees in different ways for different end products. Again, it's just, we, we've stopped thinking like this. We don't see the natural world as being sort. We, what we want to do now is take all that material, shred it up into, into sawdust and then glue it together into fiber boards and things like that, because then they're all straight and homogenous and, 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 and sort of universal, where actually we want to reintroduce this complexity back into our world, really. Um, yep. And this is another really key thing, is this is a permaculture group of course, uh, volunteering at the garden. But this is this becomes a, this is our strategy for how we build community. Is people need to work together for common long-term objectives. That that's really the, the the tool that builds community and society. And what I've enjoyed a lot doing over recent years is planting gardens, especially orchards, in spaces that no one owns, council land, road verges, those kind of places community spaces. So then a, a community then has an asset that it can collectively care about. And <clears throat> what we've done over the years is we've had all sorts of activities there. We had storytelling events and we do tree planting events and teach people how to scythe and how to prune and uh, press apple juice, all those sort of things. Now see, all of these things are, are <clears throat> really are just strategies to build community, to get people to hang out together and interact with each other. That's how it, that's how it works. So as much as I'm trying to, we're trying to create landscapes that create a diversity for nature, is it then we want to create a diversity of opportunity so the community and people can interact with that, find their place within it, their niche within this landscape. Um, so as it's matured, it's just become a thing of its own. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, we designed this herb garden and we constructed it out of the willow that we'd all been growing the previous years. So again, it's this recurring idea of the materials you're going to use are what's there already, or the things that you can generate on site. So um, I'm going to invite my friend Rose from Rwanda uh, to chat to you on one of the evenings, and if we can get her on a good enough connection. And so she's working with a school, uh, Save School, um, where we're going to put a food forest within the school that also stops, it's got really bad gully erosion from flooding, and it's very, very steep land. 
and we're going to, to, to resolve the flooding. We're going to do it by putting a forest garden in through the, through the, the school that also harvests the water and stops the erosion. So <clears throat> we can turn the problem into a solution. We can turn all that gully erosion and excess water into a system that harvests water and then creates mangoes and avocados and guavas and anything else that we can, we can stack into that landscape. So, and what Rose is doing now is she started a nursery and she's generating all the plants that we're going to use on, on site. So there's no garden centers to go to. <clears throat> we're gonna have to create the, the materials on site. <clears throat> and so this is kind of what I was thinking about five, six years ago when I put the willow coppices in, is that I know it's gonna be useful. I don't know exactly what I'm gonna use it for. I know it's going to be useful. And, and there we are building our herb garden out of it. Um, we've also put a living willow structure. This is a, a fun thing to, to do. In fact, I think that was how I met Hannah. She came and worked, worked with us on that originally. And um, again, it's just like a fun play space. It's something to invite children into. There's something about that, just that shape of that garden that makes people want to go into it and interact with it. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve in permaculture. But of course, all the plants in it all have different uses. We put lots of dye plants and medicinal plants and um, just you know, herbs and, and, and everything. And it's, you go there in the summer and it's humming with insects. Whereas you realize quickly that a lot of the landscape you walk through isn't. And that's my memory of childhood actually was that was the air, air was thick with insects and it's not, and that kind of scares me now. Um, we used to go to um, my grand from Dundee in Scotland, so we used to drive up the uh, M6, is it, I don't know, uh, all the way up there every now and again. And um, we, when we were kids, we'd have to stop three or four times on the motorway to clean the windscreen because you couldn't see out of it. It was so thick with splattered, you know, insects. You can drive all the way to Dundee now without stopping once. It can't be good. So we really need to, again, it's going back to think about we have to value every component of the ecosystem. So what we noticed, firstly, was we went through the, the, we went through the field and when we looked to the garden, the garden area, um, there was many, many insects. And the next thing we noticed was all of the swifts and the house martins were swooping over that part of the field because they were feeding. And again, it's also an obvious thing to say, but all of these, you know, the insects are the, are the food for everything else. And it, they're absolutely essential components of the system. I mean, even if you find flies a bit annoying, is you have to understand is they're an essential part of the, of the overall ecosystem. They feed a lot of the other insects and also very involved in uh, of, of elements like birds and things. They're also involved in breaking down organic matter and returning it to soil. So I even saw this thing on a TED talk or something the other day and someone was saying, oh, they worked out some laser system where you can shoot down um, mosquitoes. He said, nobody wants mosquitoes. And I thought, well, it's a no, not nice to be bitten by mosquitoes, I agree, and it's not nice to get malaria. But mosquitoes are essential food for many, many, many other in, um, uh, birds and things. So I think we start to see things as enemies. We're starting to not understand how it really works. And um, we've got to sort of take our value systems away a little bit, understand nature for what it is. Um, okay, well, this is about community again. This is, um, the team that created Cultivate, which is an organization in Newtown, that is, it was the end product of our three, we did a two year project building this, the garden I showed you. And then from that, we got funding from the National Lottery to do take that further. And then when the funding ran out, it actually evolved into its own cooperative organization, which is called Cultivate. And um, you see uh, Emma Maxwell in there in the middle in the red shirt. She's going to be talking to you later on uh, in the course. She's a very, very experienced food grower. And Richard Edwards next to her in the kind of pale shirt, um, who Lisa will tell you a bit about because she's now farming his field. So these are community connections that have come about accidentally through permaculture. We didn't necessarily have a set plan. But by doing these things, it attracted together a group of people who had those interests and motivations. And then from that, new things have come, which have created opportunities for other people down the line. So again, as I think you have to see, permaculture is, is this process of enablement as well. And it's all about bringing people together. This is um, our 
home, uh, we got a little community shop. It's a housing cooperative in Florida. Um, it was called Dragons before, so we, we stuck with the name. And again, it's a, a kind of a community statement of, a, of, of collaboration. If we can collaborate together as people, we can achieve so much more. And again, I think we've, in a way, again, as the human thinking has simplified the natural world, we've also simplified society. Hey, there is no society anymore. We're all just individual consumers buying stuff from Tesco's. Well, I don't know if that really works for me. And I, again, it's part of life strategies to create connections and to create a sort of a, a, a dialogue, a constructive dialogue. Uh, so that we can create more things. Okay, that's that. Thank you for that. I'm going to take a few questions or any thoughts or feedback. Just, just like a general warm up, getting it, getting this going. Thing uh, presentation that one. Uh, any 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 feedback from anyone? Kai Bodvar, Kai Bodvar definitely needs a size day. We went down there yesterday. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know, when we go down at the weekend, maybe I'll be tempted to take my pruners and sort out the Willow Dome again. Yeah, that'd be really nice, have a, a, some activities to do down there. It's, it's been an amazing process doing that, it really has. Mama, uh, mm. Okay. So it's, it's, it's 10 to one. I said we'd stop by half past one. And I, I'm gonna take us into the next activity. And this is something which I'm going to challenge you to do for yourself. And um, you may choose to share it with other people or you might choose not to, that's up to you. Um, but this is, this, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to share mine. I'm not gonna to go into too much detail. Um, but this is, so this is an activity called the River of Life. And it's about thinking about the journey that we have been on. How do I get that to maximize? I saw a little sign there. Oh, okay, let's do it like that. Look, okay, so, not a very good picture. Imagine your life as a river. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it'll have some kind of an end or a transition, shall we say. And think of that river. It, think about how it begins as a tiny little brook or a little issue of water coming out of the hills, um, slowly gathering speed, gathering momentum, you know, flowing down through the stream, burbling brook, crashing through the rocks, twists and turns along the way. And then it slowly reaches the lower lands and it flattens and it broadens and it becomes more clear in its path and maybe a stronger flow. And as that process goes on, the river gets bigger and bigger and then eventually it starts to join with the sea. We get the estuary, you get a sort of brackish, salty water. And eventually that's, that river joins the sea, which is kind of a nice metaphor for life, okay? Um, we're going on, the, we're all on this journey. Some of us are at the beginning of it, and some of us are more, more into that journey than others. So it's, it's interesting to think about. So I found it, uh, I, I, it's all, what I want you to do to think about is your own journey that you have been on and how that may have shaped you, informed you, and, and made you some, in some ways what you are. So this is about making observations about yourself. So if I was to share a little bit of my journey, is when I was a little, a little babbling stream uh, at the very beginning, um, I was born on a farm. Um, it was called Oaklands, and it was uh, between Wolverhampton and Bridgenorth, Shropshire. And um, it was an old fashioned farm with lots of small fields, and each field had different crops. And my dad had nine guys working for him. Uh, <clears throat> So we'd have a team of blokes every morning go, what are we doing today, boss? And, and stuff like that. And old fashioned, I put a little old fashioned Massey Ferguson tractor there. And trees, I was fascinated with natural world as a kid. I spent my whole childhood, I never really played with toys or anything like that. I played in the woods, we made dens, we climbed trees, we played in the rivers, we caught the tadpoles, we just interacted with nature. 
and, and all of my memories really of, of being a child of playing in nature and dens and all that sort of stuff. It was just, it was great. It was perfect current childhood really, uh, which I'm very grateful for. So the next, um, oops, the next thing that happened in my life, uh, then I put an asthma inhaler because my life was totally shaped by the fact was I was hyperallergenic. I was allergic to everything around me. So as much as I enjoyed playing in nature, I went anywhere near a wheat field or straw bales, I'd go blue in the face and I'd go off, taken off to hospital and be ventilated to survive. So um, as much as it was a sort of paradisical, wonderful, real childhood, as a kid, I could walk as, as far as I could walk in any direction and I wouldn't meet anyone who didn't know who I was. And that was the world I took for granted because that was how I had experienced it. Surrounded by people who kind of know you and care about you a little bit and, and um, in this natural world, but totally limited by health issues. And slowly a dawning realization later on in life is that the farm wasn't organic. I mean, it was largely organic, but they still used various different things. And some of those compounds within farming are, are really hyperallergenic. So I wondered whether as much as it was a paradisical place to live, it, I also was confronted with some of the limitations of that. But you'll notice that I put naught to 10. Um, so at 10, my world changed completely. Um, and <clears throat> one day my parents sat us down at the dining room table, kitchen table, and said, can you imagine if we had to leave, where would you want to go? And we said, well, we wouldn't leave. This is where we're from. We're from here, this physical place. I am of this of this land. And that was when my parents told me that they didn't own the farm, they only rented it. And I didn't really even know the difference between such a thing. But then you're confronted with this reality of, no, our farm is financially failing. The people who own it want to sell it. We can't afford to buy it. So now we're homeless. Great, start all over again. So that was like the whole world collapsing. That, that definitely shaped my, my worldview and my life experience. Um, the next thing that happened, Okay, look, I put a few more dates in there and, and none of us know how long we're going to be here for. That's one thing we don't know. But what I know is, well, Bill Morrison, I think he was 81 when he passed away. But what I know is if you get to 80 and you haven't done the things that you're planning to do, you probably let it a bit late. You know, we've got a sense of a timeline is we want to maybe retire and have, relax a bit at the end of our lives. Um, you've only got so much time to get stuff done. So just think about that. Think about where you are in that life journey. And I, I think that's kind of important. So the next thing happened to me was when I was 12, my parents didn't really know what to do with me. Their own lives imploded. Um, it was the 1970s, so my mother was put on Valium and stuff like that, and she was strung out on that for about the next six or eight years. And uh, my father went off and retrained and basically hardly ever saw him again because he was always at work. It was never, because before it was home, on the farm, around the kitchen table, all of that, all of that ended. Um, at 12, they sent me to boarding school. And I got sent to um, Adams Grammar School in Newport in Shropshire. I've got to say, which is the same school that Jeremy Corbyn went to, so I'm, I'm proud of that. I think Jeremy hated it even more than I did. Um, it was such a straight-laced, suffocating, learning by numbers kind of world. And... It was also a boarding school, so it was, it was like you never, never get to escape from it. And I was, I was there until I was 16, and what boarding school taught me was how to duck and dive, was how to bend the rules so you could get away with doing what you wanted without getting caught. That was it, really. Um, I learned a little bit of maths and stuff. I mean, I got a few O-levels. The thing is, I'm pretty I'm clever enough. So I could pass all the tests without really turning up, you know, it just, just, it was never hard. Anyway, so that was kind of, that put me into a strange space where, so when I was 16 and wondering what the hell I was going to do as a young adult, uh, the school told me very clearly is, you're not welcome back. <laughs> Please do not come back to the sixth form. And so I hadn't done anything wrong uh, as such. I wasn't a bad person. I can say that from 14, every Friday night for two years, we climbed out the windows of the boarding house and we went up into the town and we had a job in the local nightclub on a Friday night, had rock night and have a live band and they'd play till two o'clock in the morning. 
And me and my mates would carry all the PA downstairs and stuff, and they'd let us in for free. So I was kind of having this wild time as, as, a, as, a, as a teenager, but not really doing what I was supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be learning, not going out to nightclubs and listening to heavy rock music. But that was my, that was my escape. So, oh, another thing happened when I was 13, which I think the next thing I want to show, uh, which also really changed my life a lot, is, I don't know if you can see that, um, I had a really bad bi back hack, right, bad bicycle accident and I hit my head. I fractured my skull, I was unconscious, I was in a coma for a couple of weeks and stuff like that, scared the hell out of my parents. Um, these are always significant events. I had four terms off school, actually, um, well, no, two terms off school uh, whilst I was recovering, and I never really fully integrated back into the school life. That's probably another reason why they didn't sort of celebrate my presence there so much, was I was kind of on this outside tangent. Um, so then that led to the most wonderful and amazing thing that I, that, that I hadn't planned. So at 16, the school said, no, you're not welcome back. And I, I just thought I'd go to Wolves Poly or something and do whatever it was, some stuff there. And a, an adult friend challenged me, uh, inspired me. He said, no, there's some really amazing things out there. You should go and look to see what opportunities there might be. And so and then I just grown up in Shropshire. I don't think I'd ever even been abroad. We were farmers. We didn't have time to go on holiday and stuff like that. My dad could never leave the farm for more than a day or two anyway. So we used to go to like Fairbourne and Harlech and places like that because they're quite close. Um, and at 16, um, I, was, I was inspired to apply to go to, it was called a Commonwealth Trust. And it was somebody had this individual vision was to create a learning environment where there were people from all over the world, all over from the Commonwealth anyway, uh, living together as a community. There were no rules, but everything we did, we had to dig them up by negotiation. So I did that from 16 to 18. And I lived in a community of people from Nigeria and Kuala Lumpur and Hong Kong and Kenya and, and I don't know, America. And we lived in the, the Laurentian Mountains in Canada. That's where I put the maple leaf there. I would spend two years of my life living in the mountains in Canada. And not just that, but we got to travel around. So I put this, uh, I got to go to the States, travel all over the States as well. Um, I've, I've driven from Quebec City to Vancouver and back again. And I got to do that when I was 16, 17. That was just awesome. And, and be part of this, this sort of very interesting group of people. And that just, opened my mind. I just suddenly realized that everything that I'd learned so far was just a cultural trope, like something that had been given to you by the community that you're in. And as soon as you go to another country, as in French speaking Canada, um, in the mountains, everything was different. And you, you, you realize is life is more, there's much more to it than what you're just presented with and just what, like what you learn from within your community. I think that. Um, I came back 18 and went to university. I went to Reading University uh, where I studied sustainable development. Even actually, I need to mention, even at 16, at 16, I met a guy, one of the guys in the college in Canada was a guy called Jerry Pennells, and he taught what was called social biology, which is about human interactions with the, with the living world. And that was the first thing I sat in a lesson school and go, wow, this is so interesting. And I suddenly found, I was already on a permaculture journey by 16. And maybe in part because of my background growing up on a farm, but then secondly was meeting this teacher who opened my mind to ecology. I was also studying economics. And it struck me as well that later when I got into permaculture, is that permaculture exists at the intersection between ecology, but the planet and how it, the needs of the planet and economy of how people meet their needs. So that's also kind of one of my definitions of permaculture is the intersection between economics and ecology. How do we meet our needs in a way in which is also beneficial to the planet? Um, I graduated in 1984 in sustainable development. And the main thing that sustainable development taught me was that development isn't sustainable. Uh, and and, and that, that, that really made me understand that humanity was on a track to a place that we didn't want to go to. And I can say that everything that they taught me about back in the early 80s is now what's happening in terms of the ecological damage that we're seeing and experiencing and, and, and so forth. So 
that again that put me on a different path because I realized I couldn't just go and get a mainstream straight job knowing what I knew I had to forge my own way somehow so the first job I did after university I went, actually went to India for, a, for nearly a year and then when I came back I, I worked for an organization called World Education Berkshire and they had a big red bus and it was an education unit that went around schools in Berkshire and confronted education with the ideas that they're not weren't thinking about about um about how we perceive the roles of women in society or people of color in society of about our relationship to the environment all, all those things that i felt were really essential within permaculture were the things that were not really being taught about in school so that was kind of what sent me on this track of being involved in education was doing this work for World Education Berkshire. And I even got to drive the bus as well. So that was kind of cool. Um, I'll speak this through a bit now because it does go on a bit, but um, trees came back into my life. After, uh, uh, so put that back in, is working on a radical education project was, was kind of great. It was only three days a week and very low pay. So what happened was you end up, after three years of doing that, you end up being really skinned. And, um, and that was, I couldn't afford to buy a pair of shoes or something, you know, so I realized it wasn't going to be my whole future was doing, being involved in this education project. And I didn't know what to do because I just been trained academics. I didn't really know how to, had any hard skills. And then again, I sort of feel our vulnerability in our Western world where we know how to type on keyboards and make complex arguments. We don't really know how to grow food or, or climb a tree or something. So. I got a job as a tree surgeon. I, I persuaded a local company to train me. I did that for 18 months and saved up enough money, just enough money to think about the possibility of escape. This was the mid eighties. This was the Thatcher, height of the Thatcher era and the beginning of the kind of neoliberal economics, which we're now seeing kind of destroying much of the social economy. And we were very angry back then. I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time campaigning and placards and all of that stuff being angry about what was happening in the country at the minor strike and all of those things. And then I, I kind of quickly realized, I don't want to be the kind of person who's angry all the time. That's just not me. I want to be in a creative space rather than a tear it all down kind of space. So I, I really wanted to find a change. I didn't know how to do it. And um, I had a very close friend at the time, uh, Sue Cameron, and, and we kind of cooked up a plan between us. She wanted to travel the world. I wanted to go to Africa. And so what we thought we'd do is we'd go to Africa on our way around the world. And uh, so um, there it is. I put a little map in there. There's Africa. I flew to, I bought a one-way, well, I was 26. I bought a one-way ticket to Kenya. I got rid of every one of my possessions in the UK. And I, did, I, had a, I think between us, we had two or three grand. And we took a one-way flight to Kenya. I don't know if you can see on the map, but we did a very long, complex journey around. I think we went to about 14 different countries over the next three years. And it ended up living in Zimbabwe. Just that's how it happened. And I ended up being the um, caretaker of a permaculture farm. And I just I put a little permaculture flower in there to represent it. Do, do you know what happens is uh, the furthest, the end place we got to is a place called Chimani Mani, which is on the, it's the edge of the world almost. You get to the most eastern part of Zimbabwe, and then there's a huge mountain range. And um, which is almost impossible to cross. The other side is Mozambique. I got there, and the last house on the road had a little sign on the wall, uh, on the gate, saying cheese for sale. And I thought, oh, wow, cheese, that sounds nice. I knocked on the door, guy let me in. I sat down in his kitchen, he gave me a slice of cheese, and I just had this feeling of, I've arrived. This is where I'm supposed to be. Um, I just I overwhelmed with it. I'm not very intuitive like that, but I just had a sense of this is this is the place. And the guy saw me some cheese and he was like, you can go now. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, strangely, again, I, later that day, I met someone else who introduced me to somebody else who then told me this guy, Graham Metlicamp is his name, um, was having to go away for some weeks and he needed someone to look after his house, um, which involved having two cows, milking them by hand, and making the cheese. I didn't know how to make cheese, Graham taught me. And very, very sadly, a few months later, Graham had some real problems in his life. His wife had gone away, taking his kids to Cape Town. And 
uh, sadly, he took his own life. So that was a very sad thing. Um, I became then, I inherited his legacy. I was in his house eating his cheese and he wasn't there. And I slowly started to study the farm. And I thought, this is extraordinary. Everything is connected to everything else. It's this, I mean, I grew up on a farm, but this was like nothing that I'd seen. Um, I was, I've never in my life seen such a productive piece of land, really. It's eight acres. What he was producing on it was just staggering. It was so abundant. There was um, a dam that was full of fish. If you wanted to eat Lake Bream for your lunch, you throw a line in the pond, you'd have one in a minute or two. I mean, it was just crazy. Um, fruit trees, macadamia nuts, oyster nuts, you name it. Growing veg, he would even grow his own wheat and milled his own bread. I mean, it was awesome what he was doing. So I became a student of Graham. And um, it was a very, very big part of my life. It shaped me enormously. And, and, and I spent three years living there. And then realized ultimately though, I needed to come home, I need to come back to the UK. I need to be in a place that was, you know, it was complicated living in Zimbabwe, much as I love it there. Um, so I came back to Britain. And then I had this whole big journey. So I was 29, just about 30 when I came back. And um, I'd had this idea, inspired by Graham's farm, of, I want to do that here. I want a farm. I want land. I want to do permaculture in a, in a temperate climate and learn how to do it here. Because it was like this new thing. It was like this treasure I discovered. And I came back to Britain. I didn't, at that time, I didn't even know that permaculture was a thing. I hadn't heard about Bill Mollison. I hadn't read his book. That's the first thing I did when I got back was buy Bill's book and read it. Um, I just thought it was a thing, an African thing. I actually thought permaculture was African at first. And it was only later I discovered about, you know, other dimensions to it. Um, so it took three years from coming back to figuring out how to start community, how to buy land, I learned how to do cooperatives. And in 1995, we bought, we started our first housing co-op. It was called Chicken Shack, which is why I've got a chicken on the, on the timeline. And um, um, there were three, three houses and five acres of land. And we bought it for 105,000 pounds. It was really run down. It was cold and quite tough. But it was a massive adventure. With eight of us, I formed a community of eight people. And um, again, very difficult to do. Um, but also in 95, which is when that was, the next picture is of the Center for Alternative Technology, Canolva and Technolag Amgen in um, Hantle, which is the world's first eco center. The first real like, university of sustainability was in Hantle. And it just happened to be a mile down the road of where I first was living when I moved to Wales. I didn't really even know about it, to be honest. I was just luck. And in 95, they ran a permaculture course, and I met many of the people that I now work with and my most important colleagues. I met them all on that PDC in 1995. That's why I want you so much to interact with each other and get to know each other, because you, you're part of a peer group that maybe can travel with you for, for many years. I, I, I really value it. And so many connections have come about through these courses. It's helped me in the genesis of, of many other new projects. And I, like, like, I was inspired, Graham inspired me in Zimbabwe enough to come back. Like I was on fire when I came back. I was so motivated to do something. And Chicken Shack, on the 1st of August this year, Chicken Shack will be 25 years old. So we've helped create a community. And I moved away from there 12 years ago for various reasons. And, um, but it's flourished without me. I was there, but yeah, whatever, anyway. So that's another thing about permaculture. We want to create systems that are not reliant on you in the longer term, because you might not always be there. Uh, the next picture is the Reading Roof Garden. So the first people I worked with that had the big red bus, the World Education Berkshire, they evolved, evolved to become Reading International Solidarity Center. And um, they've got a big old falling down building in the center of Reading and turned it into an education center. And after I'd finished working at CAT, they invited me to go back, I think I was about 42 then, um, to design, help establish an educational forest garden on the roof of the building. 
It's called the Risk Roof Garden. And it's now one of the best examples of a forest garden you can see anywhere in the UK. So do check out risk.org.uk and, and, and um, find out a bit more about the roof garden. We, we, I think it had 170 species of plants that we put on the garden on the roof, every one with multiple uses. They had to have at least three uses before we put them on the roof, accept them into the, into the design. So it creates a, an amazing educational space that also boosts the diversity and increases the humidity in the cities and insect populations and feeds the birds and all sorts of stuff like that. So again, my experience at CAT and at risk really started to give me insight into how we can use design to massively enhance the ecological value of, well, a CAT was an old slate quarry where it had pretty much no, nothing in it and on, on, on this roof garden. And also slowly at, at Chicken Shack, the farm's called Bring Fluin, we transferred again what was a sheep desert into a really diverse mixed environment. And um, it's just, it's really booming. So just being able to sort of go through these processes is what, again, has really informed my whole journey. Uh, okay, sometime around the end of the risk project, can I stopped working there. Um, oh, yeah. Lovely. Um, we created Sector 39. And Sector 39, the idea of that was to accelerate change. An enterprise is about communicating permaculture in a way in which we can accelerate change very quickly. So the uh, Reading Roof Garden is at 39 London Street in Reading. So one of the reasons that um, it's called Sector 39 is because that was at 39. It's the energy emanating from the risk roof garden. And I thought I'd learned so much from that, I wanted to bring that on my journey. But interestingly, when I was at school, when I was at primary school, and we had sports and games, you had a peg number, and you had to have your number of your pegs sewn into your sports kit, your football shirt, or whatever. So, you know, it was knows, knows where to go. And my peg number was 39. So I'd always noticed it. Of ever I've got, whenever I sit at a table or a bus or get a ticket for a queue, if it says 39 on it, I know it's something's right with the world anyway so i digress a little bit and uh, my friend ollie designed that logo it's based on a crop circle he told me and there's three inner circles which are the three ethics of permaculture and then there are 12 segments which are the 12 principles so it embodies the permaculture idea and me and my ambition to try and uh create change in the world all within a little diagram so there we go look, my little logo i'm very proud of it um Whoops. So, yeah, you know, and then on we go, we did Come Harry project. Um, um, after I finished Come Harry, I decided to be more ambitious. I, I knew that Africa was part of my story and I wanted to reconnect with it. And it just so happened that there's a very strong link between Shambhaslin and Uganda. And in 2011, I'd hosted a visit from some people who'd come over from Uganda, from uh, Kamuli. And um, in 2014, they invited me to go and visit them, which I did. And whilst I was there, I had this idea of, I'd like to contribute. I want to do something. I don't really know what I can do. The only thing I know what to do, how to do is teach permaculture, really. And then I thought, aha, I can teach permaculture. So in 2015, I took out a little a loan from Robert Owen the Community Bank and to invest into Sector 13, I'm trying to make it really something. And we went out there in 2015, 2016 was actually, we did our first permaculture course, which was amazingly, went really, really well. And that encouraged us to go back in 2017, 2018. And then we started, we did some work with the, um, having done these courses, that got us into, oh, that's the end of it. Okay, there we go. Um, and I'm now 57, so I haven't quite got to the, uh, the 60 mark. And I'm figuring out what are my other ambitions? What is it? I think I've got another, another decent sized project in me, um, which is what really is the Permaculture Academy is about. I'm trying to think now is how, how can we turn this into uh, something that's bigger, more ambitious, more inclusive. It's not just about me, but it's about how we you know, get permaculture out there. So I, I'm now in the process of starting four training centers, four hubs, two in Uganda, one in Kenya, and one in, um, in, in Rwanda. And then 
from that, because we've now trained about 200 people in Africa in permaculture. So we've got this amazing human resource to, to draw on. Um, and I'm thinking about that. And maybe I've got a book in me, I'm not sure. But, um, so here we are. And at some point, I want to better, you know, hang up my spurs a little bit and find somewhere else to, uh, you know. But um, as I say, I think I'm realizing I've got a certain amount of time and space to achieve the things I want to do. And then I'm very happy just to, you know, go sit in my garden or whatever. So there you go. There's, that's, that's my river of life. And so far, and um, I invite you to think about your own. Have a sketch, have a, have a few things. You know, I just, you don't have to do it like I did, just, just draw it with a pen maybe or anything. But just, what were the turning points? What were the things that sent you on your way? What were the things that most influenced you? What ideas have you carried with you throughout the whole journey? I, I think it's really interesting to think about that. So the first thing I'm trying to encourage you to make observations about is yourself, your journey, what, where that came from, how that might have influenced and shaped you. And I now realize that the experience of losing the farm um, as a kid was the reason why I'm so into housing co-ops and I'm not really into private ownership because I saw that as, um, you know, I don't know, somehow it, it influenced me a lot in that. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, we just just gone a quarter past one, so that's okay. Um, please, any comments or thoughts on any of the stuff that we've just been talking about? Let's, let's open up the, uh, the forum and um, let's just have a few thoughts so far and then we'll go into lunch and we'll, we'll see you again a bit later. It's a really good story, Steve. Really, really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. It's been quite a journey, I can, I can tell you for sure. <laughs> I love the whole idea of us all being able to listen to each other's hearts and what's on there. Because to me, that's what, if you like, everything that's been created has. A, it has a little um, something to outwork itself. You know, how do the birds know where to migrate to? There's just something in them that gets them to where they're meant to be somehow. Yeah. And I just think that's something that's really interesting in listening to each other. I, I grew up in a house that had house martins. We had millions of house martins. I we grew up hearing them. Um, and I knew that they migrate to Africa, but that was just like a vague idea. And then I was on the beach in Kenya a few years ago, and it was, it was the day before Christmas, and suddenly a whole lot of house martins turned up. I just thought, wow, they've come all the way from Shropshire. That's awesome. <laughs> like, I even recognize some of them, I think. <laughs> I'd uh, say something again. Sorry for you hearing my voice again. But getting back to the, the question of uh, productivity, you know, the 90% the of land, 1% of G, GDP. Um, so I've, I've read in various places that, you know, the, the productivity of an allotment is what, 10 to 20 times that of, um, of, of commercially farmed land. So I think that that's the, the side of, permaculture from a practical point of view that we need to try and get across to people and do it by um, practical means i.e buying buying bits of land developing forest gardening permaculture and just demonstrating how productive this method of farming can be compared with the sheep desert there's a very clear correlation duncan between the bigger the smaller the farm, the more productive it is per square meter. And when you get down to allotment sizes, they're incredibly productive. That's because you're paying enormous amounts of attention to detail. If you've got a, a, a thousand hectares, there's only really one way to farm it, and that is monoculture and grazing animals. But the more you come down to detail, then the chance then, yeah, you can do something way, way more. So we can easily do better than that. We can do better than those sheep farms, definitely. So we, we could see that as an advantage. That's yeah, a really good thought. The, the problem around here though has been um, getting our hands on land, as, as you know. So um, it's all owned by people and you know, I'm lucky enough to have a little bit of an allotment spot that um, I've got plants, I, I can't plant, we're running out of space. Well, that's why what Bridget's doing is so exciting. And it, what, again, what John can say as well is how can we collaborate to get much more access to land? And I think as we go into the, post-EU, post-farm um, subsidy world, 
that will change really quickly. The challenge is, though, as well, is, I mean, we've just, just with our, I think, um, you know, Sue Dolmanson's just got a little plot in the community garden by our flats here, and mm. nobody's eaten the food, so I, and I've just sort of grown, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to eat the food, so it's just sort of finding ways of using it. I'm just sort of interested, you know, when you said the trees had to have three, um, three uses? Yeah, three functions. Yeah, like, could you give me an example of one, please? Um, <laughs> there's so many different plants there, so one of the ones we had, um, a herbaceous plant, Hemerocallus, uh, uh, daylily. So a daylily, which is, <clears throat> it grows a series of, a, a really beautiful flower, but only this lasts for a day, and then another, another one comes, and another one comes. So they're edible. And they really taste nice, actually, and, and you could add a little colour into a salad or something like that. And obviously they're really good for insects, they really bring in the pollinators. So you're thinking of valuing the plant in different ways. And then we researched into a bit more and we realized that the leaves are very strong, got straight fibers, and you can weave them and make plaits and ropes out of them. Okay. And apparently the, um, you know, those French shoes with rope soles, they're called espadrilles, mm -hmm. but they're made out of lily leaves. Oh, okay. So it just, again, so actually I, I, I read that or found that fact out and shared it with them. And one of the volunteers then made a beautiful basket out of the willow leaves, out of the, sort of the um, uh, uh, day lily leaves. So, yeah, and again, it's like, <clears throat> we grow a lot of willow and a lot of systems. So it's a really great plant for biomass. You get a lot of, of physical material, but also willow flowers are, are very early in the year. So it's a great pollinator plant, and it, that, a lot of that pollen is feeding bees. So, it, so the willow can be very, very good at building up insect populations, as well as creating a biomass. And then obviously you can shape the willow hedges and how you grow it. So it also perhaps becomes a windbreak or a wildlife corridor. And it's like serving really quite different functions. So we're trying to encourage to look at, there's a rule in permaculture that every element performs multiple functions. And we start to look at things like that. So, and when, when you can create, add lots of multiple functioning elements together, that's how you start to get these really diverse, really productive landscapes. Is there a, because I'm really ignorant, um, is there a book with a list of the diverse uses of plants? Do you know what I mean? So with the, with the cross keys, car park and whatever, yeah. I'm really wanting to be spot, but I wouldn't know where to start. I'll, I'll, I'll try and put something together to bring you into that world of, of permaculture yeah. plants, multifunctioning plants. And there's a lot of resources. I've set up a Dropbox. It's not quite how it works, but um, I put there's several gigabytes of information in there, all the videos, all the slideshows, and loads of books as well as PDFs, are all in this Dropbox. So I will share that with everybody. And um, yeah, so there are plenty of resources to come. Thank we'll make you. sure we do that, Sean. Yeah. Hi, yeah, hi. Lindsay. Yeah, I notice. Um, I guess I'm going to share something a, a little personal, but I notice like my comparing mind and going like, oh, excuse my language, sorry. This is mm -hmm. But yeah, I notice this kind of, whoa, have I left it too late? Basically, this feeling of like looking at what you've learned and the accumulation of knowledge that you must have got through your life. And I'm like, wow, I'm planting a seed for the first time at 44. And although I'm seeing like a garden down here, like grow fast and flourish. Mm all of that you know nature is you know it doesn't take much um for that kind of um yeah for life to, yeah. to feed life there is also a part of me that's just like whoa like a, a, a sense of grief i think actually that mm. like why is it taken to this point for me to start to learn um and i'm not going to blame that on anybody else part of that is like western education and its focus of course sure. which academic but also a part of, the, of myself that hasn't been interested and why what why wasn't I interested when I am nature and nature mm. so yeah I just I just wanted to offer that reflection because I I want to name that part of me that compares to other people early on so that I can mm. kind of get that to one side and just enjoy being here with you with all of the diverse experiences we bring what's so great Lindsay is you didn't wait until you were 42 <laughs> let's look at it like that you know and it is part of what when I came across film culture also as I felt that every part of my life before that had just been a separate thing. I did some education work, I'd done some tree work, I'd been on a farm, I did whatever. And then suddenly when I came across film culture, it's like, oh, it all knits together. 
because suddenly actually the teaching, the farming, the growing, the trees and all of that suddenly become a whole. And you might, find, you might start to value some of the skills that you've acquired along the way, Lindsay, it, it is, you know, people skills or soft skills and things that fit maybe into the people care side of permaculture. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, we all approach it from a different start point. So, so don't feel like you've missed out. And I think that's an important thing, actually, is like permaculture isn't just about the relationship with the landscape. It is that whole system thing. Yeah. That system approach. So, yeah, that's helpful to have that name. Mm -hmm. You know, placing yourself within community and saying that community is now with, is within the natural world in that sort of ethical model. And that really helps, again, kind of place yourself in, in, in the bigger scheme of things and see where you're at and how you can have impact. Thanks for that. Anyone else? You can, if nobody else is going to speak, I've just got a little thought, but I'll wait until. No, do you far away, Sean? I know it's just like if you got if we're going to observe nature, Lindsay, you know, you get that one plant. I've done anything about these things, but you know what I've heard in the desert that doesn't bloom except once every so many years. Do you know what I mean? And then you get other plants that are there. And I was talking to my friend yesterday about gardens and she's a gardener and um, she was just looking at her garden and we were just, uh, you know, I just I happened to have come across a lovely verse that just sort of said everything has its own splendor. The animals have its splendor, the plants have its splendor. And I was just chatting with her about how each individual, we all have our own splendor, something that, you know, we can look at all the screen here, we're all different, but we communicate something precious. Yeah. And we were reflecting about that in the garden. And she was saying, sometimes you've got the flowers that just keep blooming day in, day out, day in, day out. And you could look at Prof Steve's life and it has been a really interesting journey and things have worked together, but perhaps you're, I mean, I'm sure you've got loads of things. But your life will look different as well. And, you know, you've got a different place in the garden, if you like, do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. patient and kind and and just enjoying each other and our journey is really important, isn't it? Yeah, and we can all apply these ideas, the same ideas, but we'll all create something unique and different because yeah. every place is different, every skill set is different, everyone's aesthetic is different. And again, so it's, again, a big, big component about perm culture is embracing diversity. It's, mm. The fact that we're not all the same and every climate isn't the same and every plant, you know, we, we, and to value every component, even if it is a mosquito or even if it is something that doesn't, might be annoying in some ways, but it's, it's tremendously <laughs> important perhaps in others, you know. Yeah. Can I just clarify when we're doing this exercise, so when we're drawing our rivers, the mm -hmm. observations are how has, you, how has your journey shaped you and what insights might have you continue to bring along with you is that the second reflection yes i think so yeah it is so the things that have shaped you and informed you and, and and the things that you've kind of carried with you on the whole journey you know some ideas are very you know passing and other things i think you start to realize those are things that you really deeply care about from, from a practical point of view is that our only practical exercise for today that's your practical exercise for today han's going to give you some ideas this evening which you can work with tomorrow yeah, I was going to say, it'd be really nice to discuss that because actually, as you, as you said it, I've, I've written some notes down and yeah. um, I've realised like I'm actually kind of quite uncomfortable with, I don't know, my life, or like everyone's life is, has been quite a journey. And yeah, looking back at the past, I'm sort of almost quite uncomfortable even thinking about it. So I'm like, oh yeah, I I had a job when I was 20 and it was this. Um, yeah. That's it, facts. I don't want to like like explore the feelings behind yeah, that. No, so I think you really, there's no pressure to share that. it. There's no pressure to share it. I want you to reflect on it for yourself. And then if you do, if you do in some way find it useful, then you can share the insight that it gave you. But you don't really is no expectation. Because it might be really, really deeply private. And I missed out loads of messy things in my own so I wasn't going to tell yeah, you about that. You know. <laughs> um, but I think sometimes it is, it is helpful to have, like it would be helpful for me to have a conversation, chat to people tonight about that. It would be nice because, um, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share stuff. It's just... Uh, yeah, sometimes sitting by yourself thinking about things, it's hard to think where to go with it, really. Yeah. So at least it's going to set up have some breakout rooms in the evening, so we can we can talk in smaller groups as well. So it's a little you know, less time consuming and it's a bit easier to do. <laughs> okay. Well, we've we've reached the half past one mark, um, so we'll take a pause. And we're going to be turning the screen back on at six. 
and then we'll start formal presentation at seven. So get a bit of chance for people to chat and stuff like that. And that's what we're going to do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know actually how much I'm going to be able to take part because I'm going to be doing bedtime because it's seven and eight. But anyway, I okay. might join for the end bit. We'll see what well, happens. Come, come for the end bit, but, but yeah, yeah, whatever. We shall be recording things and posting them. Do you have a chance to catch it up if you miss anything? Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Jock and Valley Aaron, everybody, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope it's been an interesting morning. And um, we're on our way. We're on, the, on a roll. So great. Really thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.